Jed, welcome to the podcast. Hello, mate. Thanks for having me. Now, this is going to be a great episode because we are going to discuss that all-important topic of getting your first car. And this is something, obviously, we've all had to deal with. And some of us may have had someone to show us the ropes and others like me didn't. That's where I had to wing it. Um, but before we get into the meat of the discussion, I just want to have a chat about your own experience with cars. Um, so just want to go into a little bit of detail about yourself and you know your experience with cars from your first car to the car you have now. Uh, yeah, well, I've owned quite a few cars. I was pretty, my first car was uh, bought by my old man. So mm-hmm. I didn't really have a great deal of input into that. Um, it was before I joined the military, so I wasn't very mechanically minded at that point. Um, I just let garages and everything do that for me at that point until one time I had a brake uh, brake issue and it ended up costing, I think, three, four hundred pounds. <laughs> At that point, I was like, um, next time I'm going to look at it myself. Yeah, yeah. At that point, any issues I had, I dug into it myself, and everything's been done by myself ever since, really. Yeah. So you've got, so you know your car from back to front now, then? Yeah, from from that point on, yeah. Everything, yeah. Everything's <laughs> it's pretty done. pretty good incentive not to hand over three, four hundred pounds each time, like. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially if you're doing it for work, you might as well do it on your own car. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. So, so, yeah, yeah. Something I do want to ask actually is a lot of people I think find it very intimidating to work on cars. Is there any um, ways you could recommend to the audience to either get that courage to work on it or what resources did you use um, when you were working on cars? Obviously, you're an engineer by trade, but for someone who uh, wants to do, wants to work up that courage or that confidence to work on their own car. What could you advice could you give to them, and what resources are available? Um, well, nowadays, but back when about fifteen years ago, I had my first car. So there's only things like Haynes manuals and uh, dockets and stuff like that that you could use. But now there's like YouTube's a great source. Pretty much find anything or something very similar to the job you're taking on on YouTube. Yeah, just watching somebody do it. It's once you've watched it, you're like, oh, is that it? Yeah, <laughs> is that it? Nice? And if you've got basic basic hands-on, basic tool skills is apart from like very complex big time jobs, most of it's quite quite straightforward really. Yeah. So it's not it's not this um information overwhelm that it's made out to be. No, not really. It's all very scary pulling your car apart and making sure <laughs> you can put it back together. But once you've done it, say if you pull it apart, it's like, oh is that it? Yeah. But yeah, well that's good to hear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, because I know certainly for me, um I wouldn't have pulled my car apart certainly to the extent that you've had, but certainly the first time I did various maintenance on it, I was like double, triple check. And is this right? Cause you know, you don't want to screw things up, especially when it comes to things like brakes. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> but yeah. Um, so the very first question I'd love to ask is what let's put ourselves in a scenario here. You're 18 again, or you're advising an 18 year old who's come to you and asking you for advice. And they're saying, I'm going to buy my first car what is the fundamentals of a good first car? Um, right. Well, the first thing I would always say, because a, a few of friends of mine have gone, oh, I want this car. Mm-hmm. Quite young. I've got the money for it. And they've not looked at insurance. And they've bought cars, depending on they like the car. They've got enough money to buy it. But then being a certain age or the car's in a certain category, their insurance has outweighed the price of the car. Mm-hmm. The first thing I'd always say is check the insurance first. Right. Because you can get two, three thousand pound quotes on a car that's fifteen hundred quid just because your age or yeah type of car. Yeah. Um but a first car basis I'd say would be quite small engine, petrol or diesel. Um, so that'll save you on insurance, it'll save you on fuel, it'll save you on tax. Yeah. Um <clears throat> is that something we could dive into a little bit there just because obviously you've had so much experience with the amount of cars you've owned um ripped apart you understand you yeah. know you've done you've done you've done this several times now do you know any tips or tricks insurance wise that you could advise to people um well there's always the little the the usual things you can do add in add in a parent or a grandparent on there mm-hmm. the, the usual black boxes but 
I'd say don't add a black box if you don't intend on driving sensibly. <laughs> you get some some bad ticks on that black box. It's just going to end up making worse for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but then obviously researching the car that you want to buy because it could not necessarily be quite a high-powered car or expensive car. Say like your Vauxhall courses, um, things like that from years ago. They weren't very fast, but they were a very popular young person's car. And it yeah. was built off how much, how many times these particular cars have been claimed off. So if they're always getting crashed and like Honda Civics and things like that, they're going to be more expensive, even though it's not an expensive car. Okay, that makes sense. That's that's quite interesting. So insurance is obviously based off a, a, a how much of a risk you are. And if yeah. young people are consistently buying this type of car and because of their inexperience constantly crashing it, then even though it's a cheap car, it's going to be quite high on in insurance. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, if it follows a quite a, a trend, like young people are buying these cars because they like their cars, they're cheap to buy, but then they're all crashing them and there's loads of claims going in and in, like Vauxhall Corsa, this many claims that sends the premiums up. Right, okay. Yeah, on the, uh, I used to go on the like comparison sites, find a car, get a reg and just type it in and then see what roughly came up and if it wasn't worth the price then i'd just cancel getting that car off yeah that's something i want to ask probably at the end of this line of questioning of what you think reasonable prices for a first car would be now obviously that's very nuanced but um i feel like you know if you walk up to someone and say i want to buy my first car i think it's you know especially if you're 18 or 19 and you don't know what you're doing you're very easy to take advantage of and people yeah. can you know get a few hundred pounds out of you more than you really should have given. But something you did say very early on there that I wanted to dive a little bit into more is tax and categories. Um, with regards to tax, do you have any advice for people who um, obviously uh, different vehicles and, and categories, as you mentioned, will have higher or lower rates of tax, but do you have any advice on that front at all? Um, not particularly for first cars because tax tend to go on the value of the car and the the emissions output right maybe your more expensive cars your larger engine cars where tax would be going up but if you can afford a newer well especially the newer diesels mm -hmm. some of them are 30 pounds some of them are free to tax for the whole year so it's yeah another thing like the insurance just have a look a little look into it yeah like the older the cars the less efficient the engine is the more uh, co2 the engine's going to pump out therefore the higher the tax so it's just another thing like the insurance just have a little nose about what it's going to be so if you can't afford a newer car you might just have to take the hit on a bit more expensive tax yeah yeah but especially when you're a student every penny counts so you know the research is key here and you yeah. said something you said something else as well there are categories for people who aren't car savvy uh, i don't really know what they're doing what do you mean by categories of cars um, well, the insured tax and insurance have all got categories going up, up in different increments. So it depends on what what your car's emissions output is. It'll fall into a certain category. Mm -hmm. So the higher the emissions, the higher the category you'll fall into. Right. Okay. They have changed now. I think it's from 2017. They've changed from the emissions to the value of the car. Mm -hmm. So if you bought a really expensive new BMW that only had a little two liter turbo diesel engine in it. You can some of them are paying like four hundred pounds a year. Flip me, just right. because it's going off the value of the car now, not what its emissions are. Right. Okay. So that's really good information to know. Yeah. Then Same uh, as, uh, insurance, your yeah. horsepower and uh, engine size and stuff will put you in different categories. So the higher up the category, the more expensive it's going to be to insure it. Yeah. And is there an easy way to compare all this information? Uh, yeah. If you can get um, get your registration for the car you're looking at. You can go online, you can go on the DVLA and have a look and it'll tell you all the info about it. Everything yeah. you need to know about that certain car and how much it will cost you to, to tax it. All you just need is a what car it is and the registration. Yeah. And before we move on to the next line of questioning, I feel like this would be really important. How do you tax a car? Now, I obviously, I've done it, you've done it. But for someone who's never done this before, it's a very easy process. But just go through very quickly how you tax a car. Um, well, now it's, definitely easier than it used to be mm. you can do it all online but you what you get if you purchase your new car you get a form called a v5c and there'll be a registration number on there you go onto dvla.gov and uh, 
just follow the links for tax my vehicle it'll ask for your your uh, i think it's 12 digit uh, code at mm -hmm. this point probably just have the new keepers slip with the little green slip put the code in there put your name your reg and where and your address where you want this new form to be sent and uh, well obviously make the payment and then uh, probably two weeks later on you'll you'll receive a new v5 in the post with your name your details saying that you own that car and it's now taxed yeah yeah that's very good and when insuring a car how what would be what for getting like the best deals obviously there's comparison sites and such but in your opinion what's the best way about going about to insure your car do you use comparison websites yourself or do you go direct um, yeah i used to use comparison websites but uh because my all my cars are modified mm -hmm. there are specific modified insurers ah right okay with, with they will decrease their quotes because it's modified so the more they, as they see it the more money you've put into your car yeah they'll value it differently so you've got a certain car the insurance company will just type in oh it's like a 2008 ford focus but if you've put ten thousand pounds worth of modifications on it that obviously needs to change the valuation of the car yeah and then they see it as he's put a load of money into this car the last he doesn't he's less likely to smash it into a wall yeah okay that's very good um yeah. the, the only other thing i've used I've got oh, comparison sites. Yeah, don't. Okay. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. And uh, you mentioned some documentation there. When buying your first car, what's the, what is the documentation that should come with your first car? Or any car for that matter? For buying the first car, you'll get a V5C. Mm -hmm. And V5C can you just form. briefly describe that form for people? Uh, well, it's a red and white form. I've actually got one somewhere, which I could show you. <laughs> yeah, no worries at all. Uh, while he's grabbing that, folks, I uh, hope you're enjoying this so far. And we will have about another 10 questions to ask here. If you do enjoy this and want to see more of this type of content, do let us know. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, he is now just presenting it. There you go. Yeah, that's your V5C form. Mm -hmm. That's what you'll get when you purchase your car. Okay, yeah. And then, like I was saying earlier, you've got different categories, as we can see in here. Yes. So all the different categories, the different engine sizes, the different engine output. Yep. Um, as a new buyer, because this would be in the previous owner's name, so he can't give you the whole form. Yes. So what you'd do is you'd get this green segment here. Yep. New keeper's form. They'd tear yep. this out. You'd fill all your details in, and then this little slip's got enough info for you to do the online, the online uh, transfer. And then you'll get a whole new one of those in your name sent to you after you've purchased the car. Okay, fair enough. And is there any other documentation that should come with the car? Um, not should come with the car, no, but there are other docs that you should look out for, like full service histories, um, if it's an old car, previous taxes, previous MOT receipts, um, just maintenance receipts, stuff like mm. that. If you can buy a car and you open the glove box and there's a big old docket of receipts you know that that car's been looked after it's had a lot of it's had a lot of its parts replaced it's had it's had a good owner previously that's looked after it yeah yeah and if you don't if you don't get something at least something you know that not much has been replaced on that car and you could have to replace quite a lot of it in your ownership yeah yeah fair enough and this suddenly made me think that if you are going to buy your first car, what red flags would you be looking for to say this is not a good purchase or this is a dubious owner? Um, yeah, well, if you know somebody that's a bit car savvy, I'd suggest taking them with you. Mm -hmm. um, but things, things to look out for would be have a good look around the brakes uh, for scoring, pitting, rust. Rust's definitely a big one. Uh, don't be scared to get on your hands and knees and have a look underneath because there's stuff like brakes, rust, tires. It can be, they can say it's all good to go, but you can get it home and then do a month's ownership, have to do all brakes, all tires. Yeah. Uh, maybe like track rod ends, other perishable bits like that. And you can be over a thousand pounds in parts. 
a moment yeah. down the line and you've only just bought it. Yeah. Is there, a, you say like rust on brakes and stuff, that's a biggie. But um, what about the tires? Is there a quick way to look at a tire and go, right, that's definitely at the end of its life or that's not safe? Uh, yeah. Well, tires would be try and have a look at them and see if they're, they're wearing flat. Mm hmm. So if they say the inner edge is normally, if the tracking's not done, the inner edge will be completely bald and smooth. Mm -hmm. um, you've got uh, 1.6 mil of tread is the legal max limit. Yeah. So if you've got um, like a 10p, you know, on the inside of the 10p, there's like that little ridged edge. Yeah. That's 1.6 mil. So if you put a 10p in there and they're not as deep as that, you know, the tires are knackered. Okay. That's a very handy trick then. Yeah, that's just, really good to know um yeah you're allowed um you're allowed below that for a third of the tire right so if only like the inner edge is a bit worn but the rest is fine and then you can get away with it for a little bit but if the tires weren't i'd say well over that i'd get them to change it or walk away yeah yeah 100 percent. and what about looking under the bonnet what any any what red flags there would indicate that this is not a good purchase or a dubious um, owner yeah under the bonnet i'd definitely get your phone out get the torch get the torch out look for look for leaks oil leaks water leaks um any corrosion where coolants come out because if the coolants come out and it's on the engine block you'll see all sorts of like that white pitting and like rust around the place which shouldn't be there because you know there's a leak Mm -hmm. uh, could be could be really small leak it could be something quite serious mm -hmm. um i'd always always dip the engine take a little rag or some tissues with you dip the oil um make sure there's enough oil in there make sure it's not like really black and sludgy and horrible yeah um i take the oil filler cap out and have a look inside of it and if right. there's any any milkiness in there that could um could be an onset of your head gasket going right okay so if the head gasket's gone your coolant's gone into your oil which makes it mix up and it turns all that milky like milky white color mm. so that'd be a big one if that's you've got milk in there yeah and that's absolutely do not buy that car because the head gasket change is pretty pretty big yeah, you'd be oh, thousands of change to get the work done <laughs> so yeah yeah that's that's really handy to know then um so that's what, in fact, actually, just one last thing. Anything interior to the car? Red flags that you should be um, aware of? Uh, yeah, well, um, if it's a manual, I'd say shifter play. You get hold of the knob and not like aggressively move it like you're changing into gear, but just like two fingers and waggle it where it's supposed to be nice and firm. If that moves, then mm. it's in your shifter could be worn. Or put your foot on the brake and let the handbrake off and see how many clicks it is to go up. Because if that's all the way at the top, you might need a new handbrake cable, which is not a small job either. Mm. Um, just wear and tear, really, but that won't affect, yeah. won't affect anything. Um, stuff like if it's a two-door, test the, the seat releases. Because sometimes you don't try and get in the back when you're buying a car, but <laughs> you get out, seats don't come forward. Um, yeah, it's... That's yeah. about it, really. There... Too much. Yeah. And what about if the, like, for example, I, my first car that I bought last year is uh, manual, but I ended up driving my dad's car for years, which was uh, an automatic. Is there anything worth checking with an automatic, or is that something you can't really check? Um, Not really, no. Just, no. Um, just then again, your receipts and stuff like that, trying to look through when it was last serviced, <laughs> when the gearbox was last oil changed. Um. Yeah, just things like that. Try and try and look for depending on mileage, whether it's got a cam belt or a cam chain. When was it done? Does it have a dual mass flywheel? When was that changed? Because these can all be really big, really big jobs. Your cam belt is normally required at about 60, 60 to seventy thousand miles. So if you're buying it roughly on there and it hasn't been done, that's an instant sign that you're going to have to pump in about probably eight hundred quid labour oh to get word. very soon. Because if you, it's not one of them ones, I'll just be like, oh, I'll ignore it for a bit. Because if it snaps, you, it'll write your whole engine off. And then it'll cost you even more. Yeah, so. you don't want that. Um, that's really good. Uh, we'll move on to our <clears throat> uh, next question here. 
which is um, basic car maintenance. Um, so obviously we briefly touched on um, we briefly touched on the ripping your car apart and building that confidence to, to do it uh, and the resources available for it. But you've now successfully bought your first car. It's taxed, it's insured. Um, but obviously, as you run it, as with all machines, they need constant maintenance. So um, let's just go through very quickly the basic maintenance that you are expected to, to be able to do without fobbing this off to a mechanic um, and spending pointless money on something you could have done yourself. So uh, what, what basic maintenance uh, would you do on your car on a daily, weekly, monthly or annual basis? Um, well, the basic stuff is really always always check tires, oil levels, and coolant levels. It's all the time. You get always always get people that they just put fuel in and drive and drive until something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. So, especially if it's been sitting for a while or you've not driven it or you're going on a long journey. Always get the bonnet up. Always check the oil. Check you've got enough coolant in there. Have a little check for leaks. Um, if you've got any doubt about is your car leaking if you're losing coolant which is called normally one of them slide a big bit of cardboard under your car overnight mm. and then pull it out in the morning and see if there's anything on it yeah um yes but other than other than that unless you really want to get hands on i'd say learning how to service your car yourself is uh, quite a good one to know and what does that involve um Well, you've got different levels of servicing up to like a major service, which would include your engine oil and oil filter, fuel filter, um, changing the coolant, changing your spark plugs, changing your pollen filter inside the cabin. Um, There's other stuff like you can do power steering fluid, depending on how long that's been in there, gearbox fluid. Um, They're only normally annually, which would be your oil coolant and spark plugs and your filters mm-hmm. but as a, a couple of hundred pounds you can save on there especially if you're especially if you're doing a lot of mileage i wouldn't leave it 12 months yeah, yeah i yeah. do i do all my oil and everything at least five thousand miles wouldn't wouldn't leave it any longer than that but some people do twenty thousand miles in a year and don't change anything which yeah it's just one for don't have to do it but it's good to know yeah, and it saves you money as well, and you and you build up your knowledge of cars in the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's hundreds of online videos of people changing, changing oil, changing spark plugs, filters, and stuff. Yeah, is there is there a YouTube channel you could recommend that I could put in the show notes for the audience, just so that because obviously there is hundreds, but you know not all mechanics are equal. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you have a if you have a preferred source of information that's reliable and good uh, within the sphere of youtube or or any anything else online i'll we'll have a chat about that after the after the show and i'll put it in the show notes for everybody um but something i do want i want to get down to the absolute bare basic bones um people i've got questions here like how do i fill up my washer fluid how do i change my oil i feel like if these are the most basic things it is worth exploring those uh just for a little bit because if someone has never done this and yeah, they could go on YouTube, um, but just very quickly to let people know it's not this impossible task. How do you change your washer fluid, or how do you fill it up, and what should you be looking for? Because I know certainly when I've when I've went to Halfords that there's the winter version, there's the summer version, or there's an all year version. You know, what's uh, what would you recommend, and how do you do this job? Um, well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Topping up your your washer fluid. Yeah. Um, it's literally just, it's normally a little yellow cap and it'll have a picture of a windscreen with some water squirting on it. Mm-hmm. Just, it's normally not, not even a screw cap. It's just a pop-up, pop-up cap. Get yourself a funnel. You can just use water if that's all you've got. Um, the washer fluid is normally, it's just like a soapy detergent. You can buy pre-mixed or mm-hmm. concentrate, but if you're, if you need it, water's fine. Yeah. Yeah, just get a bottle and a funnel, fill it up to the, the max line, put the cap back on. Easy as that. Easy as that, yeah. Yeah, so it's not so intimidating, everybody, you can do it. Um, something I do want to actually do a dive into is engine oil, because that's very important. All You know, you can't just, um, 
apply a generic engine oil where cars have very specific oils that they have to use. Can we just briefly describe how, if someone said, right, I need to change my engine oil, but I don't want to pay the mechanic, um, but I know how to sell engine oil, what's the step-by-step -step process for finding out what's the correct oil for your car, um, tips and tricks for filling it up um, and, and all that kind of thing. What would you say to that person? Um, well, definitely find out what oil your car takes first. Um, it should say in your owner's manual, or if you haven't got it, just a quick quick online search will show you most most normal cars are a 5W30 oil. And uh, and just what, can you briefly describe what a 5W30 means or what, what those numbers actually mean to people? Um, yeah, W means the weight and 5 is the viscosity at cold temperature and 30 is the viscosity once it's warmed up. Mm -hmm. So depending on the tolerances in your engine, you'll have different numbers depending on... Um, I don't know what you use the car for. If it's just daily motoring, it's not going to get um, not going to get thrashed about. If you took, if you say it was your daily car and you wanted to do some track days or something like that, you'd have to run a different oil because the standard one, once it got really hot, wouldn't uh, provide the correct lubricating properties, and you'd probably end up wrecking your engine. Right. Okay. But yeah, you can get um, Halfords or Euro car parts or GSF, somewhere like that. They've always got a uh, ridiculous. Uh, savings on most of the time where you can pick up some oil um, always find out how much you need because unless you've got quite a small engine it normally takes more than five liters so if you buy five liters and you get halfway through the job and you haven't got enough yeah you can't exactly drive your car back to the shop to go get some more yeah exactly yeah uh... there get yourself a new oil filter so always change the filter when you change the oil um sump plugs some sump plugs will have a little uh, bronze O-seal, which you can get with the filter for changing. Some don't require them, so it's best to have a little research into that. Um, but step by step really would be, you need a jack, obviously. Jack, couple of axle stands. Don't get under the car on just a jack, because it might squash you. Yeah, exactly, I don't want that. Yeah, you can get, a bucket what i find with a bucket you've got to you've got to jack the car quite a way up to get the the height of the bucket underneath but you can so if you're going to halfridge you can buy a specific oil change in uh, bucket it's a bit like a jerry can with a recess on the inside of it mm -hmm. so you slide it in and then it drain it all straight into there um so jack it up preferably on a level surface axle stands get underneath it with your uh, your bucket and uh, take the sump plug out once your sump plug's out, I'd go up and uh, take the engine cap out and the dipstick, which allows the air to come out and your oil will come out quicker. Um, try and take the car for a little five, ten minute drive beforehand, sort of warm the oil up, helps it all come out a bit faster. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, once it's all drained out, try and change your oil filter. Some of these are different. Some of them are in different places. Some of them are quite hard to get out. You can buy a an oil filter ratchet because some of them are they're pretty difficult to get at they're like round and cylinder and they require twisting out but some of it depends how long it's been there depends who's put it in whether you can get it out and um, so it's worth worth buying one of those you can get a, a multi-use one that changes size depending on what filter you're using uh, so once you roll your oils out change your filter put your sump plug back in make sure it's torqued up to the correct spec don't over tighten it because it's just an aluminium sump. And if you round that off, you're going to cause yourself some serious issues. Yeah. So you get a proper torque wrench. Uh, yeah. Best. Best torque wrench yeah. on it. Yeah. If possible or nothing massive, don't use like a massive breaker bar. On it. Just, <laughs> just a little spanner and nip it up. So you think, yeah, that's, that's enough. Um, yeah. Once you're all back together, uh, take it off the stands, put it back down on a level ground, and then with a funnel, leave your dipstick out, funnel in your uh, oil top-up cap, and then just start filling it slowly. Don't bang it all in at once, because it takes, it's got a lot of engine to pass through and parts before it all gets back down to the sump. So the last thing you want to be doing is bunging it all in, dipping it and thinking, oh, there's nothing there, nothing there, nothing there, and then it all comes in at once and you put too much in. You have to drain it again. <laughs> Restart it again and then drain some of your brand new oil back out. So yeah, just do it, do it slow, take your time. 
keep dipping it, keep making sure that you get uh, bang on between the min and max lines on your dipstick. And then uh, once you're happy, I'd uh, turn it on, let it warm up, check your your oil lights gone out if it has if it came on, and then I just have a look around for leaks, check that sump plug, check the oil filter, make sure there's no leaks, and you put them in tight enough. And that's it. Done. Yeah, fair enough. And I suppose between the YouTube videos or if you've got a friend who's car savvy, I mean, ideally you won't be doing this by yourself. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty good information. The uh, last question we do have actually is car cleaning tips. Um, so you've got your car, it's well maintained, it's all going well. Um, but if you've got a car, you want to make it look nice on the outside. So what um, car cleaning tips do you have for people? Uh, cleaning tips well you can go you can go very deep into into cleaning yeah um i'd say well let's say let's say someone who's just who doesn't really care about their cars just getting them from a to b what basic cleaning tips could they do and then i would like to chat about people who are really into their cars they want that certain aesthetic um yeah. we'll, we'll we'll tackle that but for people who just want to get from a to b what what cleaning tips do you recommend for their car interior and exterior um I'd always go for a get a snow if you've got a pressure washer, always go for a snow foam. Um so so easy to use, it's really good. Um gets all that. Uh they call it a non non contact phase. So they try and what it does, it'll you spray it on, leave it for five odd minutes and it'll eat all the dirt that's on there. So what you don't want to be doing is with all the dirt on there going in with your with your uh, your sponge or whatever you're using and rubbing all that dirt around because it's going to scratch up your car. So mm-hmm. you spray your snow foam on big thick layer, leave it there, and it eats that, and then you pressure wash it off. Um, but you can get, I think, Demon Shine, do a pretty an alright one for not very much money from Halfords. They do one that you can literally just click into your hose if you haven't got a pressure washer. Um, yeah, and then just a, a car shampoo, a nice soft wash mitt or something like that bucket um and then probably once you clean get a a nice towel or a chamois or something like that dry it off and then you can get a product called a quick detailer which is a bit like a spray wax and you just spray it on rub it about and then buff it off which will Mm -hmm. give you a nice little protection afterwards and quite a nice shine for not very much money um i think in halfords they'll do uh, i think it's a quick a quick starter set or something by Maguire's where you can but you'll come with a bucket, uh, a wash mitt, shampoo, and a quick detail, everything you need to you can just pick it up and you can go and give your car quite a decent clean. Mm-hmm. Happy days. Um, so then if that's for the people who are ready to be, let's say people like yourself, proper petrol heads, so to speak. Um, what would you recommend for cleaning your car? Or people who are of a similar interest in cars. Um, don't well, I'd say don't be ex- afraid of buying expensive stuff. It's like it's expensive for a reason. Um, a favorite of mine is Built Hamber at the moment. Their stuff's really good and pretty reasonably priced. A lot of it comes in quite a high concentrate, so it might seem quite expensive, but you'll get hundreds of washes out of let's say one of the bottles. Um, I'd say always use a two bucket, two bucket method. Um, get lots of microfibers, lots of drying towels, uh, lots of decent brushes. Um, yeah, decent snow foam, maybe a a pre wash underneath the snow foam or mixed in with the snow foam. Um, give it a really good non contact washing. Um, then go into the the washing down phase with decent shampoo, which again I use uh, built hambo. Um, yeah, that's about it really. And make sure you give it a good a good dry in. Uh, yeah. Some people some people use the the blow dryer instead of towels to get to get um get all the water off, but they're they're pretty expensive. Probably a couple of hundred quid for one of those. Um, they are good, but expensive. Yeah, and I'm assuming there's lots of YouTube videos on this anyway, for because we can't go into the finer details on the podcast. But like I said before, I'll put whatever YouTube channel or resources you recommend in the show notes. But um, just one more time, what's the name of that company? Which one? The sorry, the one that you use for cleaning. Built the Hamber. one. 
Bill Bill Hamber, am I saying that Bilt. correctly? Oh, Bilt? Yeah. Right, no, okay. B-U-L-T. Yeah. Amber. Um, ah, right, okay. Well, we'll put that yeah. in the show. Any, any decent, like, I use uh, Slim's Detailing to get most of my stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, good channel I always use on YouTube is Forensic Detailing. A really nice guy on there called John, and he just does it all in his garage, and he talks you through everything. Anything you want to know, he will go in very depth about yeah. all of it. So he's he's a good one to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just the last question on cleaning then is interior. Now that's a world of pain if you like spill something in there or you really don't know what you're doing. But what what advice can you offer people to make sure the interior of their car is as good as it can be, or they can just get it up to a reasonable standard? Um, yeah, I think well that that'll depend on quite a lot on what what your interior is, whether you just want it clean or whether you've spilt something. There are specific interior cleaners which you can use. There's um, there's stuff for dashes, there's stuff for your seats. Um, There's leather if you've got leather seats. Um, Yeah, I think like just look for what, it'll all depend on what you've got really. If you've got leather seats then you're obviously gonna need a leather leather cleaner. Uh, There's stuff like uh, cockpit cleanse, which it's a bit like a quick detailer, but for the inside, so it gives you that nice sleek shine, uh, a bit of dust prevention. It's always got a good smell. Um, get yourself a fabric cleaner, which will just spray all over your over your seats and your fabric, and you'll have to uh, go at it with a little brush. But yeah, I'd say a cockpit cleanser and like a fabric cleaner would be on a brush. It's probably all you'd need for keeping the inside nice. And okay. Humble. Fantastic. Um, a question I did forget to ask, and this is going to be out of place because it was meant supposed to be mentioned earlier, uh, was when people are buying a car, could you explain the advantages and disadvantages of a petrol or diesel engine? Like what, what, like what's the good and bad of both, and or what would you go, what would you suggest to someone buying their first car, and why? Um, well, diesels te- technically you get more miles per gallon. Um. They're normally cheaper to tax, and they normally uh, run a lot longer than a petrol engine. Um, but they're more, especially on the cheaper one, cheaper end. The diesels are more sought after, so the car might cost you a bit more uh, in the first place because lots of people want want it. Um, if you're doing quite a lot of motor mileage, I think like a nice torquey diesel engine would sit at seventy miles an hour better than a little. 1.2 petrol engine that's chugging its head off trying to get down the motorway. Um, yeah, but it depends on what you're after, really. Um, if you want, petrols are normally faster, so if you wanted a bit of a faster car, so petrols would be would be better. But if you wanted just a nice economical, if you're not fussed about how fast you're going. You just want to save fuel. You just want it to be cheap and get you from A to B. Then probably a little diesel would be better. Mm-hmm. But if you want a faster car, a um, little bit more fun, be a petrol then. Yeah, petrols are normally a bit faster. If you're like me and you like the like the noise of the car and you like uh, having a spirited drive now and again, the petrols will be faster. Petrols will sound better. So if we're like the younger lads out there, the petrol will sound better. Will be more appealing for them, but. Technically, the diesels are normally cheaper and easier to run than the petrol. Yeah, a hundred percent. And do you have any last bits of advice for people in regards to their cars? So, like for me, my own advice to people would be to invest in good quality tools for it. Like I've got a basic um, kit in the back of my car for you know any basic repairs that need to be made. I've got a jump starter. Uh, battery box um, I've got a spare can of oil if I ever need it I've got a spare window washer all it's all this stuff is always in the back of my car so that any minor fixes I, can, I don't need to call out the RIC or whatever I can just um, uh, I can just do it myself by the roadside but that's my bit of advice for people what do you have any advice for people who are either buy, last bits of advice for buying their first car or even just running their car in general if they have had a car for years and they've maybe just it is just getting from A to B they don't do any maintenance do you have any advice at all um i'd say more just 
don't be scared of lifting up the bonnet really and having a look around just try and make it a bit more try and get to know what's under the bonnet a little bit because if something does happen and you've got that little bit of knowledge you can you can sometimes sort yourself out yeah yeah uh, oh, actually, no. Sorry, now that I have thought about it, actually, one more question I would like to ask is: when you do, when you do break down by the side of the road, um, I'm assuming you've unfortunately had to have done that at some stage. Um, what? Oh, you've not. You just maintained your car that well. You've never broken down. There you go. Well, for people who who are in the unfortunate position who will who have or will break down in the road, um, do you think that the uh, there's like a particular roadside assistance that's worth investing in or uh, anything of that nature um racs are good and green flag but quite a lot of it your insurance company will be partnered with with a, a roadside assistance company mm-hmm. when you're getting your insurance they will offer you um who they use yeah so, um if you want it, I'd probably just take the the one with your insurance because they normally do you quite a good deal. It's all in one package, and if you if stuff needs paying for, then it goes through your insurance, and you haven't really got to worry about uh, upfronting the money and then trying to claim it back or trying to sort your insurance before any other work can get done. Yeah, um, but yeah, RAC and Green Flag are normally pretty good, but your insurance company probably will work with one of the one of those two. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it actually just made me think of one more question. Uh, I hope I'm not running into too much of your time here, but let's say, God forbid, you have an accident, road traffic collision, everybody's fine, you can all get out of your cars and you know, there's nothing too serious that's going on, but it's good the cars are damaged. If you were to advise someone and say, right, you've crashed your car, this is the mu- the, the must the do's and musts of when you've crashed your car. Like, what, what is the process of, right, I've just crashed my car, what next? Uh, well, providing you can get get your vehicle safely moved and back to either yours or if it's a total write-off, it'll get taken to a, a scrapyard for uh, processing. And then, like, the next thing would just be to get on the phone to your actual insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally, there'll be an automated line and you just follow it to uh, you've crashed your car and then they'll take it all from there, really. You just question and answer session for quite a while. Um can then go to they'll get all the details other people involved mm. uh, off the courtesy car if you need one if you've got that option yeah but it's, it's quite straightforward just give them up uh, give them a ring up and then they'll they'll do everything else really for you yeah because i've heard a lot of times that at the scene of an accident you would typically swap insurance details um so what kind of details are they do you know uh, yeah if you've if there's been a few of you crashed especially if it's not your fault you need them um, their name, a phone number, uh, vehicle, vehicle reg, take all those down. Because if it's not your fault, your insurance company will have to get hold of them to get their insurance company because it's their insurance company that will be paying you back, not yours. Yeah. So if you yeah. don't get their details, then it could end up costing you because you've not got the the people that were at fault for the crash. Yeah. Yeah, invest in a good dash cam, folks, if you can, yeah, forward and rear. Definitely worth it, front and back, if you can. Especially yeah. a lot of people trying to trying to claim things these days. But yeah, 100%. Even accidents just saves you trying to explain something. Yeah, 100%. Uh, just from our own experience, I thankfully have never crashed, but my mother was involved in a crash where she was uh, going on a roundabout and a van drove over the center of the roundabout and basically T-boned her. Um, and she had the sense to um, take pictures or at least have me take pictures of where the cars and van was. So it was quite obvious that, you know, the dude is literally on the middle of the roundabout. So if you can, don't forget to do that. Obviously, element of common sense here, folks, make sure it's safe. You're not putting yourself or other motorists in danger, but, you know, collect as much evidence as you can, get the insurance details. And then, as Jed said, phone up your insurance company. It seems quite a straightforward process to do. Um, but I think we've pretty much covered everything today there, Jed. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and talking about this topic because I wish I had all this information when I was 18 and at least considering to buy a car. Yeah. I, I wouldn't buy a car for another 10 years, but it still would have been good information to know. Um, but yeah, once again, Jed, uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. No worries. Thanks for having me.